included in the packet is the unapproved minutes of both the library board and the plan, one from September, one from October. Next item is the announcements and praise. We got quite a bit going on tonight, which is always exciting. This is a fun meeting for sure, but I take a moment for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ability to meet, to gather here. We submit our plans to you. Uh, we, even when times are hard and things are difficult, we know people are going through those right now. We uh, just want to bring you glory. We uh, appreciate the path uh, through the cross and just hoping you tonight in this meeting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Subset A, pretty awesome stuff. South Dakota Municipal League uh, fame. We have a long history of people that are from the city of Sturgis that have reached these honors. Um, simply because of the commitment to the city and the commitment to the organization. So we just wanted to make sure these were in the record. I'm also Dan Kath, Cass, Kathy Dykstra, Chief Scott Lindsgraf, Doyle Schaefer, and Doug Wagner. So I know Scott's here for sure, but a applause please, please for everybody. For <laughs> a great honor for sure and shows the dedication and, and represents as well. So next item is presentation of rally checks. We have a question here and we have a system that we hope is going to work. So we'll call you up here and we'll Take some quick pictures, and uh, we'll just go from there. But we we feel rather organized years past, so we'll see how this goes. So Daniel will hit on some of these later with the rally impact uh, that we give later in the meeting. But the rally is a situation where the city of Sturgis gets the opportunity to give back, and the whole rally as a whole gets to give back. Uh, Steve, I'm shooting from the hip here, but probably close to $600,000 was raised for this year uh, for the 2021 rally, which is huge. We're glad to do this. Um, most of these things are from the mayor's ride and things that the city has done during this year's rally that receive these these funds go to organizations within the city that work for our community um they're certainly stretched to limits during the and go above and beyond so it's just a pleasure to be a part of this we're going to start out with the sturgis volunteer fire department we've got 7500 this year it's pretty steady we've been doing for that and scott we appreciate what you guys do more people up here. Give me that for your life. <laughs> yeah, get Mr. Brook up here too. All right. Thanks, you guys. <laughs> Next one is police reserves. Um, over the years, we've a little bit. We uh, try to get more money given to these guys. They uh, operate, volunteers, uh, do a lot for our community. We've been able to buy some things over the years, but hopefully with $6,000, we can get something good for the department and for the volunteers. Thanks. Next one from the mayor's ride, we have Sturgis Ambulance. As we look at weekly reports and just pay attention to what's going on and us, the number of calls that the ambulance service has to fill every day as compared to years past. During the rally, obviously, it's a huge strain on a small amount of people. We uh, do all we can for them, and they uh, do a wonderful job. So 500 is what we have. One here is for the fire department parking lot. So we're uh, a few more units on this. It's to the south and to the east of the, or excuse me, to the west of the fire department. Made a big operation wise, but we asphalted that. And this is uh, yearly we've been given this try to knock this bill out. We only got a couple left after this year. So.
Next up, we have Deadwood View. Got anybody here? Yes, awesome. So Deadwood View has been a part of the mayor's ride for a very, very long time. Um, with road, road captains and road guards along the ride, um, it, the ride has a lot of ground. There's a lot of intersections, and it's a safe ride the whole way, and that's due to volunteers from these I'm just proud of what they've done over the years and happy to have them be a part of this because it's a lot of volunteers. They do it with a smile on their face. So, The next one's a match is what we do here. We've done a few years um, where we take some funds from the mayor's ride and then we uh, employees to match that and Every year we've reached it, I believe we've done it for two years, um, but just goes to a great cause and helps our community. <laughs> We're going to be perfect, just, just more efficient. Then we have 2500 for Love, Inc. Anybody from Love, Inc.? <laughs> Love, Inc., that's from the... Also, that's just something over the years we've got sponsors, we've got more activities that happen and more money, and just as it goes back to the community. So, appreciate you guys. Next one's uh, 25 Animal Shelter uh, co op between the city and the county. Um, a lot of uh, come on up, Chief. S certainly have a lot of um, with the animal shelter for sure. So All right, next one is, this is from the legendary 5K. Um, it's for Sturgis Outdoor Recreation, so 1500 bucks. Mr. Cole, you should probably come up here too. Anybody events, but Jerry, you are a big part of this. This gives back. Come on up, Jerry. Sam, I saw you sneak in somewhere. Are you part of this one? Yes, please. All right. I think you get it. So these are two. They're both the Sturgis Outdoor Recreation. One's from, this one's from the 5K and the other, this one's from the director's ride. So both of you get to stay up here. So a couple of quick on those events new events that happen during the rally. Jerry does his drag guide, takes people out on a different route, usually in other places. In the 5K, Jerry first brought this to council and rallying events. He said, I'm going to have a race where people run. It's like, we're going to run. And it's, it's incredible the amount of people that show up. So just shows the diversity of the comes for the rally and just more opportunities for people to do the things they love when they're here visiting our town. So stuff, Jerry. Um, from the director's ride, we got Colorado Captain 250. Getting hold of anybody for that, Jerry? Or next one's for Rally Charities. This is a uh, proceeds from the Beard and Two Contest. Relatively new event with the rally held right at Rally Point. All the spectators and the participants love this event. Just another thing rallying event help with. Uh, make activities downtown and make people's trip memorable. So, but this is from the beard and tattoo contest. So. Thank you guys now. 
can stay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, no, no, no. Yeah. Hold on. What do we got next? Yeah. We'll call you guys back here. Do you want to yeah. Let's let's just go. Let's go with it. So next one. Now we're really screwing it up. All right. You come back. You come back. <laughs> right. So this one's from uh, the pub crawl. This goes to the ambulance fund. It's for 1820, but it's more for the ambulance fund. So this was, again, Jerry's doing. Um, wasn't very well organized over the years. We've always done this, but we actually uh, made an event. People became a part of it, got swag from the city and a fun time. So and raised some money. So. From, from Travis, uh, the Sturgis Liquor Bottle Engraving. This is for Sturgis Brown High School. The scholarships is twenty six hundred bucks. Travis, you gotta stay up here. Yep. Here's another one. This is from the Jack Daniels Challenge Coins. Uh, this is for Sturgis Brown scholarships. And it's for ten thousand dollars. So. I don't know. You're staying. Next one is Sturgis Rally Charities from Sturgis. This is Rally Charity, $7,500 for the bourbon raffle. All right, more Sturgis Rally Charities here. This is the container cup sales to the Sturgis Rally Charities Endowment. Um, this is a new thing this year. It's growing as we go, but this is for seventeen thousand six hundred dollars to the endowment from the from the from the cup sales. Basically, is what this one's from. This is a portion of the sponsorships that we receive um, for the city of Sturgis for the rally, uh, but this is also to the endowment and a pretty big sum, so it's awesome. So this is to the actual rally charities and not the endowment on the con on the container open container cups. So this is from to the charities for sponsorship proceeds. Thanks, you guys, for being a part of that. Just great to be a part of giving back and to things that truly make a difference in our community, for sure. Other announcements and praise from council. Anything to add? Item 7 is city manager's report, and I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Ainsley. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. If I could just add one thing for the uh, announcements on one week from today on Monday the 25th from 4.30 to 7 o'clock, 
the Alliance of Churches will be having their chili feed. Oh, yeah. That's their uh, primary fundraiser. Uh, the money that they raise from that goes to uh, help locals uh, in the community, a lot of utility bills, rent payment, different things like that. And so it's a uh, fantastic cause. And there's a lot of different chilies that the uh, local churches as well as businesses uh, put in. And if anyone would like to be a judge, please let me know. Um, that involved a lot of Tums last time. <laughs> for one particular chili, and I don't think that one will be back. Um, and then I did, uh, to begin my uh, report, I wanted to make sure that we uh, recognize Officer uh, Tanner Weaver. He uh, has received national recognition for effectively disabling a vehicle uh, using um, the, uh, the traffic stop sticks. Um, which was a fantastic way to disable the vehicle, and it was able to get uh, the individual under um, arrest without causing any damage to um, other uh, vehicles or um, private property or anything else. And so if we could give Officer Weaver a, a round of applause. There we go. I was about to die, but it didn't work. The uh, sales tax update, this is for uh, January through August sales. In our general sales tax, which is the uh, general 2% sales that people pay, um, month over month, so 2021 compared to 2020, uh, we are up 13.5% uh, for the entire year. So all of January through August of 21, we are up 15.1% uh, for the year. The uh, top chart, you can see that's actual um, taxes collected. You can see that uh, in general, there was a decline from 2010 through 2011, then 11 to 12. Ever since then, it's been continuing to rise uh, with a significant increase that occurred in 2015. And then from 15 to 16, there was a reduction just because the uh, 75th rally was so large that there was a redu reduction. But 2016 compared to 14 was still a growth. But then really ever since 2016, we've seen just a, an immense increase in our uh, rate of change. Uh, that really has happened from our increased population as well as increase in a variety of retailers in our community. And then also the addition of online sales tax. Um, Amazon and other major retailers uh, started collecting online sales tax in 2017. Um, and also almost all others completed or started to do that in 2018. And so that does explain some of the increase that you can see in 17, but that definitely isn't all of it. And that also um, goes to show that our economy over the past several years has greatly increased because even with the addition of um, online sales, we're actually increasing even faster now. So that's uh, great news to see. And then the uh, tourism sales tax, that's the extra 1% that you pay at hotels, um, for alcohol, as well as uh, restaurants. That is up 20.3% uh, month over month. So August of 21 compared to August of 20. Uh, for the year 21 versus 20, it is up 33.3%. Uh, that really is a significant increase in tourism destinations. I think if you talk to any downtown business owner, they will tell you that uh, last year was a fantastic year and this year easily has beaten last year. Um, the number of additional tourists that we have in town is just fantastic to see. The tourism season continues to start earlier and last longer than what we've seen before. Uh, some of that's from additional events. Over the past several years, the city has added far more events. The Chamber of Commerce has added additional events. The other thing that I think is very important to um, highlight is that additional private events that have occurred. Um, there's a lot of additional private businesses in the community that are putting on more and more events that are bringing more people into our community. Um, those actually for the uh, city are some of the best events because they're not necessarily things we need to plan, but uh, they bring in a lot of extra people into our community. And also I think it's important to note that really starting um, in late 2019, but definitely in 2020 and 2021, the uh, downtown bid and the hotel bid 
really started to increase their efforts. They started to have a lot of additional revenue uh, that they've been able to use for additional events, promotions, online advertising, advertising in magazines, different things like that, uh, which we're starting to see a difference, especially when you start looking at some of the buses now that are starting to come into Sturgis. So all of that um, is going to show a significant increase uh, that we've been having. You can see that overall the Triple B fund or tourism revenue was pretty um, stable from 2010 all the way through about 2014, 2015. There was an increase, um, but it was not as large as the uh, general sales tax. And then after that, it really kind of stabilized. 17, it went up and pretty much stayed at that point. In the last two years, it's really uh, increased substantially. I'm sorry, the last year it has. Um, and then a couple um, highlighted slides that I think uh, we wanted to make sure the community was well aware of. Um, this is moving on to the uh, rally financial report. Actually, before I do that, I just want to mention that the KPI reports, the key performance indicator reports for September, we have some hard copies um, on the desk over there. If anyone is interested, um, if they would like, they should be on the uh, website right now. Um, and so if someone would like to see an actual um, a copy at their, at their home or office or on their mobile device, they can just go on the city website and they can find the report, um, which goes over most of the departments. And you can see um, how busy they are compared to years past. Uh, with that being said, we'll move on to the uh, 81st Annual City of Sturgis uh, Motorcycle Rally Financial Report. Uh, the first one to highlight is all the charitable contributions. Um, I promise this will be quick, but I think it's important, again, to really highlight that the uh, Sturgis Motorcycle Rally is really by far uh, the preeminent fundraising um, entity and event that occurs in the Black Hills. Uh, when you see all these numbers and how many different entities um, that receive funding because of the rally, it's really astound, uh, astounding. Usually when you think of the rally, you think of additional traffic or you think of uh, perhaps some economic impact from increased payroll. Really one of the largest impacts is in um, the nonprofit and charitable sectors in the Black Hills. Our uh, local artist, uh, sculptor Travis Sorensen, uh, created a guitar um, sculpture and that was uh, auctioned off raising $31,000. One that gained national attention uh, was a young man from uh, the Piedmont Somerset area. His lemonade stand generated $32,600 for St. Jude's. Um, a lot of different local efforts um, went on, including meals at uh, a lot of churches as well as parking at churches. That actually generated nearly $30,000 from that. Um, PALS received, um, they worked doing the uh, motorcycle raffle and they raised $5,000. The uh, Sturgis Brown High School uh, Meals and Showers raised $27,000. Uh, First Interstate Bank and J&P Cycles parking lot, uh, that went to local sports organizations and a couple other kind of charitable uses like that, uh, raised nearly $16,000. The hamsters, and this is something I think that cannot get enough attention. Uh, what that organization does year in and year out uh, for the Black Hills is truly astounding. Uh, this is a group of, you know, individuals, most of whom do not live in the Black Hills and come here to enjoy the rally and then truly make a lasting impact um, in the Black Hills. Uh, this year really was unbelievable. They raised $536,000 for Lifescapes of Rapid City that help um, disabled uh, children in the Black Hills. They raised $55,000 for the Sturgis Motorcycle Museum. 14000 for the Spearfish Meals on Wheels and $7,000 for other local charities. Uh, Sturgis Liquor and Brown Foreman. Um, Brown Foreman, again, the $10,000 uh, that they raised for Sturgis Brown High School Scholarships. Uh, Sturgis Liquor, the Bourbon Raffle, raised $7,500 for Sturgis Rally Charities. Uh, Sturgis Liquor, the staff there have been engraving bottles, um, etching uh, personalized bottles. They've raised over $2,600 for Sturgis Brown Scholarships. Um, and also memorial patches that have been raised for uh, veterans or active duty um, personnel for Operation Ride Home, $700 from that. Uh, Buffalo Chip raised an all-time high, $149,000. Um, that money is going to the Special Olympics of South Dakota, uh, the Sturgis Motorcycle Museum, 
and also treasured lives. So a huge impact that's going to happen for the Black Hills. Um, the city of Sturgis, when you start looking at all of this, $190,000 raised from the city of Sturgis events and activities, a huge amount of money. Um, almost all of that is being um, kept here locally so that individuals know uh, when we mentioned the endowment that was $80,000 that was raised from the endowment, the goal of that is over several years um, to hopefully have a um, million dollars or more in an endowment so that in decades to come there will be an ongoing source of revenue for charitable um, initiatives that would happen each year even if the rally attendance by the 120th uh, rally isn't quite as large as what the 81st is. That way there can be a, an ongoing lasting impact in our community. So the total raise for charities was $1.1 million. Uh, the total raise for Black Hills organizations was $1,050,000. Again, a significant amount of money, almost all of that coming from outside the Black Hills. That's more than $5 for every resident of the Black Hills. So a massive effort that is really led by the um, residents of, um, of Sturgis <laughs> and of the greater Black Hills area doing a tremendous difference in the Black Hills community. Um, a quick comment on COVID. Uh, this was one thing we we're often asked about. Um, as of October 5th, Meade County had a, a COVID-19 mortality rate that's 30 0.8% lower than the national average, which is something you never hear. 28.5% um, lower than the sixth county, uh, Black Hills region, and 39.8% lower than South Dakota's. Um, one national publication reached out to me in June to find out um, what it was like living in what had to be the epicenter of COVID-19 and wanting to know um, just what it was like when you know thousands of people evidently died when I shared with them the um, actual statistics, they were shocked and, of course, never released a story. Um, in 2020, the IZA study estimated that 266,000 cases came from the, uh, the rally last year. That, of course, raised immediate media exposure. Um, the CDC later um, did an actual study that um, every State Department of Health uh, contributed towards. Uh, those State Departments of Health would often... Uh, link any case if an individual had traveled to South Dakota during the month of August of 2020 to the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally. Um, and even having that large and that wide of a net, um, they were able to link 649 cases. Um, so again, not even 1% of what that uh, previous study was. And of course, there was far more exposure for the, uh, the baseless study versus the actual study that counted real cases. The uh, charts that you can see um, that I have here is linking the actual cases um, in South Dakota, Wyoming, North Dakota, and Nebraska uh, during the summer of 2021. And why I have this up is because um, similar to what has happened with every wave of COVID-19 is that it usually starts along the coast and then several weeks or months later, it ends up coming to the Midwest region. We're usually one of the last places to experience a major wave. That, of course, happened during the Delta variant. Um, you could see that the Delta variant um, began to affect our uh, region in South Dakota in late July. That parallels what occurred in Nebraska, in North Dakota, and Wyoming. Um, and if you look at our experience, it, it pretty closely mirrors all of our uh, all of our uh, neighbors. And again, it, it is interesting when you look at the uh, media exposure and what state they highlight versus uh, the others that pretty much experience the same thing because it's a uh, virus that's affecting everyone. <clears throat> um, also, some of my uh, favorite photos that I think we have to make sure to show. Um, some of the hypocrisy, the one on the top, uh, you can see a CNN reporter um, and her entire camera crew that was happy to be a part of uh, Sturgis not wearing masks, asking attendees why they would not be wearing masks because it's uh, quite dangerous to be at the rally. On the bottom, you can see CBS as well as um, ABC reporters, national reporters, um, who would bring up um, everything that occurred during the rally and had a lot of great coverage on it. Um, and, of course, in uh, New York, their anchors would often talk about the 
the dangerous circumstances that happen when people are outdoors um, without masks on and their employees are also outdoors without masks on enjoying the same sites. Um, but moving on to the uh, actual attendance, uh, this is something that, of course, is brought up uh, every year and has a lot of interest. Uh, the traffic, if you look, the traffic counts increased 13.8% over 2020. Um, they increased 9.5% over the five-year average, which is 2016 through 2020. Um, this graph has um, most of the years um, of the rally. The bright red line is our last year. You can see that the first several days of the rally were actually some of the highest um, traffic um, amounts that we've had, actually very close to the 75th. And then it really started to taper off, which is what um, we've seen year after year. Uh, Mount Rushmore had an incredible rally. It was a 24% increase over 2020. It increased almost 15% over the five-year average. Um, 350, uh, almost 354,000 people uh, entered the monument, which is just a phenomenal number of people. Um, looking at uh, garbage, our photo counts and parking counts, garbage was up uh, 23% over 2020 up 8.3% over our five-year average. Uh, things to consider is that it was a dry year, of course, on years when it's wet, the garbage is heavier. And so the fact that it was a dry year with almost no major uh, moisture really means that that was truly the weight of the garbage. Um, to put that into uh, perspective is 545 tons of garbage were hauled to Belfouche. Um, that's a 68-mile round trip all the way to Belfouche because, again, everything that we had load has to be uh, taken to Belfouche where it's tipped. Um, our our um, trucks usually average about 10 tons, and so that's almost uh, 55 trips that we had to take of garbage, 68 miles to get rid of it. Um, New York City, which I always find this really interesting, every about January 1st or 2nd, they talk about how much garbage has to be cleared up in New York City for their New Year celebration. Uh, that averages about a million people. It's 50 tons of garbage. Um, we do 10 times that. And so it's a, a huge effort to get that much garbage out. Now that's rally garbage. That's on top of the garbage that we have to haul just for our regular residents that we do every single day. Our photo count um, for individuals was 58% higher than the uh, five-year average. So people were definitely downtown longer. And the parking count was 21% higher than our eight-year average. Um, looking at this, this really uh, corresponds with the data that we got from all of our demographic surveys that people were spending longer and longer downtown. And so even though the traffic count was high, the traffic count was not as high as what they were, as what uh, the photos indicate and also as what the uh, garbage produced and also the parking requirements. People were spending longer and longer downtown, which is also why the next thing, our uh, temporary vendor sales tax was up 36% in South or in Sturgis over uh, last year. It was up 34% across all of South Dakota. So when people look at the uh, nice graphic that the state provided, the Department of Revenue, which they did a great job, so that when they see that, the 34%, that's across the entire Black Hills. If you look at Sturgis, it was up 36%. Um, it was a, a significant amount of um, sales occurred. And when you look at this, oftentimes it's reported as that's how many um, or the total amount of taxes that was collected. That's only taxes at temporary vendors. So really the temporary vendors are the tattoo artists, the uh, food vendors, the T-shirt people, all those people that, you know, set up in Sturgis at Exit 55, at the Buffalo Chip, at Full Throttle in Deadwood. That is not the casino's the restaurants, the hotels, the gas stations, the motorcycle dealerships. Um, when you look at our surveys, usually um, about 8 to 12% of total uh, sales occur at temporary vendors. And so this is a small fraction of the amount of uh, tax revenue that is generated. Now, also to put this in perspective, when I say tax revenue generated, Sturgis, the city of Sturgis gets a minor fraction of that because this, again, is the aggregate, you know, sales tax that occurs with the vast majority going to the state, but also to other cities as well. Um, 
but sales were up uh, 44.2% over 19, 38.8% over 18, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, looking at all the variables together, um, we're able to estimate that the uh, total attendance at uh, this year's rally was 555,000 people. So definitely a lot of people over a 10-day period in our community. And again, we're not saying that that many people were here in one day. That was over the 10-day period. Um, but still, for a community of about three square miles, that's, um, that's a lot of people. Going on to the uh, financial report, which is uh, what a lot of times people are uh, very uh, interested in, looking at our income, um, the city has a lot of different income sources, and actually the hard copy of this report is also located on that uh, desk over there. It'll be posted tomorrow on the website um, as we do each year. Uh, looking at it, the vendor fees um, were higher than what we've had in years past, but also given the number of vendors, it was not as high as what uh, we would have estimated or anticipated, but that's because every year um, more and more of what vendors pay in um, their vendor fee is transferred to sanitation. So essentially the sanitation um, was originally back in 2014 it was set as $175. That has increased 3% every single year, and we have not increased the vendor fee since 2014. So in that time, the amount of money that goes to the general fund continues to be eroded. And so that does have an impact. Our total uh, open container cup sales uh, revenue was 75280 The vast majority of that came from our private sector partners who also sold cups. Um, so there are a lot of bars and all, as well as a few hotels and other uh, individuals that purchased cups and uh, sold those. And then uh, one note when we're doing this, we still have some royalty fees that are coming in. We still have merchandise and other uh, website sales that are still occurring. And so this number will continue to grow uh, throughout the year. But undoubtedly, this is the vast majority of the revenue that will be coming in. Uh, rally expenses. If you uh, review all of our expenses, our professional fees increased. Um, a large part of that was about thirty thousand dollars that went to Live Gauge. They did our um, a large portion of our demographic survey this year. Uh, came up with a lot of very valuable information. Um, that's something that I think the um, city can determine whether or not in uh, future years we continue that contract. And also our rally mark and design registration. Those were all. Uh, new costs that we have not had to have in years past because the city has not designed and owned our own intellectual property as we did this year. The total cup expenses for the 2021 cups were $40,080. Um, our increased temporary rally um, help is what really drove our wages, our total wages or the cost of employment for uh, the rally did increase um, by about $70,000. Uh, dollars that really came about from the higher pay that we had um, for a lot of our uh, temporary help, especially in public safety. Uh, we definitely increased that so that we could be more competitive uh, with what kind of the regional averages were. So, looking at the net profit, the total net that was returned to the city, and again, I think this is important. This is the city. Um, there are other cities that also gained significantly from the rally because they had a lot of sales tax that occurred through restaurants and gas stations and hotels. And also the state of South Dakota is an entirely different uh, league. But as far as the city, from the city's efforts, the total net was $1.1 million. Uh, we were able to increase our donations to charity by 103,000. So that's an actual increase. That's not the total amount that we gave to charities from the, uh, the city's efforts, but that's a huge increase. Um, what you can see over the last several years is that traditional uh, city efforts are close to a plateau and that sponsorship, advertising, land leases, vendor fees, those do fluctuate each year, but they're fairly constant. There's not major changes in a large rally, they're up slightly. In a down rally, they're down slightly, but there's not major changes to that. Um, instead, what we're starting to see are new efforts are now um, able to expand our revenue. These are new things that we've started this year. Um, that in years past we didn't have. And so that's why you're starting to see that now there is some upside potential for the bottom line of the city. 
um, and those new efforts are the official marks, website sales, open container cups, those sorts of things that really encapsulate the the additional upside that the that the uh, rally has for the city. Are there any questions on the uh, financial report for the rally? And again, hard copies are located on the desk, and they'll be uh, this uh, presentation will be on the um, website tomorrow morning. <clears throat> then going beyond that, under payroll, uh, we do have some new changes. We have our new assistant library director that is going to be starting uh, November 1, Donia. In our ambulance, we have some new paramedics and EMTs. And then in our police, um, Autumn is uh, actually today, she started at our, at our animal control um, and she has left rallying events and is now over at Animal Control and doing a great job there. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Thanks, Daniel. Item eight is consent calendar. We have minutes. We got a contract with Rally Charities. We have resolution uh, for a plat and setting a public hearing. Does council wish to remove A through D, any of those items off for individual discussion? I'd like to remove item B, please, for discussion. Is there any other items, public or council, to remove from the consent calendar and discuss individually? So moved. So moved to approve minus B. Uh, yes, thank you. We got a motion for the consent calendar minus uh, B. Is there a second? Second. We got a second by Aaron. Any last discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please indicate by stating yes. Yes. Opposed to no. Please note unanimous for roll call on the minutes, Faye. Subset B was removed. Becca, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, sure. Um, <clears throat> within the Rally Charities contract, there is a typo. If you'll turn to, um, I believe it's the last page. Um, I, I believe that we need... The treasure needs to be updated from Mimi Shuey to Brenda Savers. Is that correct? Okay. So that's all that's all I had. Any other discussion on subset B under consent calendar? Public or council? Is there a motion? Motion to approve. With the correction? With the correction of we got, subset B. We got a first by Dean. Second. We got a second by Kevin. All those in favor of the motion, please indicate by stating yes. Yes. Opposed to no. That motion carries. Item nine is the claims. Questions, comments, concerns from council on the claims. I had a question. Um, please, on page 25 under capital improvement, I was just curious, um, the chairs for the municipal building, which building, <laughs> which building would that be, please? That was City Hall. Um, last year, we actually had, um, I think it was $75,000 um, that was in the budget so that we could uh, complete the furnishing of uh, City Hall during the remodel. We stopped uh, doing any of that in, I think, about February or March of last year. Of course, we were highly concerned about a um, recession that would end up occurring from the pandemic and everything else. We reined in all sorts of spending, so we stopped doing any of that. Of course, uh, thankfully, it seems that we've weathered that storm fairly well as a community, so now we're doing some of the uh, purchasing that was halted last year. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So some of the chairs that are over there. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on the claims, public or council? Is there a motion? I move to approve the claims. Got a first by Becca. Second. Got a second by Dave. Any last discussion? We'll go ahead and roll call. Mike, we'll start with you. Yes. Dave. Yes. Angela. Yes. Kevin. Yes. I'm yes. Becca. Yes. Dean. Yes. And Aaron. Yes. Bills are paid. <laughs> Item 10 is reports. Subset A is resolution 2021-45. This is amendment to the TIF 18. Um, included in the packet is the new resolution with the corrections on there. Um, is there additional information, Daniel, that needs to be brought forward? It's an amendment to 
continue with a project that's been a long-term project that now will continue on. So um, basically paying back the, the infrastructure over time. Questions, comments, concerns from council on the amendment to TIF 18? How about anybody in the public? Questions, comments, concerns? I would move to approve. We got a first by Dave. Second. We got a second by Dean. All those in favor of the motion, please indicate by stating yes. 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 Opposed to no. That motion carries. Item B. Item B, C, or excuse me, B, C, and D are all the same thing. Um, this is an extra step that was taken by council three or four years ago, I believe, whereas the state law requires that when an ordinance is changed, there's a first reading, then a second reading, then it's posted in the official paper, and then it becomes official after it's not referred after 20 days. That council previously made the extra step possible for discussion prior to the first reading, uh, we learned that although we know a lot at 7 a.m. when we figured all this stuff out at legal and finance and rallying events and things like that, that we need more input prior to the first reading, and that's why this extra step was added. So subset B is uh, discussion regarding Title 18. This is use on review and zoning changes, discussions that have happened over time. So we've kind of encapsulated those and tried to bring them forward. So Mr. Ainsley, I'll turn it over to you for more staff report, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, the items here really um, have been reviewed and discussed several times at several different sessions by the council when there have been different use on reviews or variances and zoning changes and requests um, during that time or comments that have been made by council members uh, to make changes to our ordinance. So uh, now with the uh, additional staffing that we have, uh, we've been able to do the research and present these uh, changes to you. This also has been reviewed by our Planning and Zoning Commission uh, members. And uh, after discussion, uh, they made the following recommendations. One is that for use on reviews and variances, that uh, you would modify the voting procedure um, by instead of sending out ballots, send out notices to property owners as well as residents that's a big change before it was just to property owners. So now it would be to the property owners as well as residents uh, to properties that are within 250 feet of the subject property. Um, that way, anyone um, within that area would be able to write comments. It's not voting um, to make sure everyone understands that, but instead it's comments so that the planning commission can weigh what all the comments are and then make a recommendation to the council and then the council also would receive those comments um, in the staff report and then be able to weigh those comments as well as a recommendation from the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission and ultimately the council can make the, uh, the choice as to uh, how to proceed. Um, Daniel, can I interject yes. there? I think it's important to note that previous, the processes that have been followed to this point and are currently still followed, is that sent out to people 200 feet within the, the property, the proposed property, but there was actually a vote taken on, on, the, on the information set out. If there, if there wasn't a response, it was assumed to be an affirmative. They were in favor of the project. Um, it's a situation where the city's taking a lot of assumptions. Um, I believe this with this discussion that it will bring more activity amongst the neighborhood for talking amongst the, the neighbors and things like that. But I just wanted to note that that's one major change that's happening in the past, if it was to pass as written. In the past, it's what's, there was an actual vote. Like Daniel said, this is no longer a vote. But with that, there's also, there's no more assumptions being done. The comments that are given are the ones that are turned in. So it does make a necessity for neighbors to become active. And with that, one of the reasons to eliminate the voting is questions about the weighting of the votes because um, if a property was uh, not assessed because it was owned by um, a governmental agency or a nonprofit or something like that, it would not be assessed. And so then it wouldn't be able to have a vote. This would still allow them to be able to provide comments. Um, in addition, it would allow residents to provide comments because before it was truly only if you owned property, you were able to provide uh, that and um, also it, it would resolve some of the issues that we have. One of the more contentious ones was the use on review application for a daycare in the Palisades subdivision. Um, it became pretty obvious that even though the votes were supposed to be um, uh, 
concealed, I guess. Um, based on the weighting, you were able to know who voted for what, and that also became a, a neighborhood uh, controversy when some individuals voted yes and other individuals voted no. This way, people can truly just write comments, and then those comments can be weighed by the Planning and Zoning Commission and ultimately by the council. Also, of course, it would allow individuals to still attend either the Planning and Zoning Commission or the City Council and make their voices heard if they would like to that way, but it provides people an opportunity to provide written commentary if you know they would rather be anonymous or, or not necessarily um, be out in the um, open and public. In addition to that, um, it for zoning changes, it does modify the voting. Um, it would require 60% approval. The reason why this is here is the state statute does require that some sort of actual voting actually end up occurring. And so for a zoning change, it would be 60% approval of landowners within 250 feet of the subject property of the subject parcel would be required. Um, and so that's 60% in the affirmative. And so that's not if 40% uh, of the uh, of the land area, if uh, they do not respond, then they are not assumed to be in approval. Uh, so that does require a lot more outreach to the property than what previously was required to have happen. This one, there would be a weighted average for uh, the votes and it would be based on the square footage of the property. And so uh, just for easy math, if um, the subject parcel as well as the other parcels within 250 feet made up 10 acres, if, the sub, if um, a property was one acre, they would have 10% of the votes. If it was two acres, they would have 20% of the votes. Um, this is something that's being suggested that essentially is kind of laid out in state statute as why there's that weighting factor. Um, the, uh, the subject parcel or the owner of the subject parcel would also be able to cast a vote as well. Um, so to make sure everyone understands that. Um, also, it does allow an opportunity that if for some reason the 60% is not met, then the applicant may appeal before the city council. So if for some reason um, they're not able to get 60%, they can make a, an appeal to the city council to say they would like to proceed with the process. At that point, the city council can hear why were they not able to get 60%. Um, maybe it's because there was a, a landowner that just is out of state and you know not willing to provide comment and so they can never get to 60% or whatever the reason is. They can plead their case before the council and the council with a two-thirds affirmative vote could allow the process to proceed. So that wouldn't actually approve the zoning. Instead, it would allow the property owner um, the ability to start the process then with the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, but ultimately, of course, that would be up to the council whether or not you want to agree to that appeal. Similar to what has occurred before, there's still a signing uh, requirement. So whether it's a variance, use on review, or a zoning change, there's a sign that is placed in the yard. That sign would be there for 21 days um, so that people driving by or walking by, whatever else, know that you know something is occurring there, that there's a use on review scheduled. For more information, they can call the Planning and Zoning Office or they can talk to the property owner to find out what it is. In addition, um, the use on reviews are also published in the city newsletter. So these are the uh, recommended modifications um, for that. Council, have any input at this point? Questions, comments, concerns? Something that's been on the discussion table for a while with the with the use on reviews and the zoning for sure. How about public input on this particular matter? Bonnie, come on up, please. I was following you, Dan, and then I got lost. Um, so you're saying the state requires an actual vote of some sort? For zoning. For zoning changes. That correct, Eric. Oh, for that. Uh, generally, the, the city can adopt. Hold, hold on one second. That's. You're going, yep. 
Okay. Um, the city generally would adopt that consent statute. And then within that, it's 60% of aggregate land value or land owners within that area. So let's say it's a rezone or requested rezone. It would be the district where the rezone would occur plus 250 feet or, or uh, landowners within 250 feet. And it would be 60% of that land area would be, you'd have to get consent from those property owners. And that's only on the zoning, change in zoning. Yeah. It wouldn't apply to use on reviews because technically that's not an actual amendment or really any change to the zoning ordinance itself. It's merely carving out uh, an already selected enumerated conditional use or use on review. It's just allowing whether or not that specific landowner can do that that consent requirement would only apply to actual amendments or changes to the zoning ordinance. So it's, okay, so that's the corner I missed yep. is the, it, that it applied to the zoning. Only to zoning, okay. not variances and not use on reviews. Okay. And then it shifted from valuation to volume. Amount. To land area. Yeah. Okay. And then Um, on the use on reviews when you're wanting to engage the neighborhood, which I think is good. And when I was involved in one of those that was disapproved, uh, the council recommended that, you know, we work on that. And I initiated that and, and on the next go round, it got, it was approved. It resolved some issues, but, um, if our intent is to provoke that sort of community interaction and understanding, how do we contact those people? We don't, you know, when you're in a situation like that, you don't have a phone number to call. You know, is, is that going to be provided? Is that part of the use on review that's available? So it would be a, a letter that would be mailed out to property owners mm -hmm. as well as to the residents. So it would be sent out to the actual property. So if it's a, a rental, then that individual who resides there would also get a letter. But then whoever's on the title, whether they're in Florida or if they're in Rapid, they would also receive it. So both the landowners as well as the resident um, would be able to receive notification that someone is asking for a use on review or a variance, and then they would be able to provide comments. And so, but how are we encouraging the engagement are you providing contact for the person who's asking for the? Yes. So there would be, at that point, there would be contact information for the applicant as well as for the planning and permitting office because usually um, most residents will want to actually speak with the city staff because there's a concern quite often about approaching the neighbor that they don't want to offend the neighbor. They don't want to bring up a concern uh, to their neighbor about, well, their dogs cause issues and so I don't want to allow them to have you know, a boarding facility because already their existing dogs cause issues or just hypothetically. But that's usually what it is, and so they want to be able to speak to, you know, the third party and express that. Okay, because when I went through this, my only avenue was to knock on the door or write a letter, which is sort of encumbered, but, you know, no phone number was available or anything, and I knocked on the door, and I was met by a pit bull and told that they didn't need a gun because that was the purpose of the dog. So I was supposed to be intimidating. That doesn't generally work on me. But uh, <laughs> I'm just thinking, you know, if, if we want something, an amicable process to go on here, um, somebody on staff has to be prepared to um, help with that interface and mediate in a sense, but facilitate. Facilitate is a better choice. Um, those connections for communication. And and Laura does that now. Um, I will state, though, that there are individual residents who often will interact with Laura but say that they do not want to speak with the applicant. And so if that's the case, then Laura holds that in confidence. And so sometimes that is frustrating for the applicant because the applicant wants to know, well, why is it an issue and I can address it or whatever. 
but if someone contacting the city staff states that they want to be held in confidence, You're then in, Bonnie. we do. Is that me? That's you. <laughs> other, other public discussion. So will that, will that sort of facilitation information um, be included in the notices? I mean, I'm just going on the experience. What, what would be in the notices that are sent out to the residents as well as the property owners is the contact information for our planning and permitting office as well as for the applicant. Okay. And so however the applicant wants to receive. Is sometimes the applicant, for whatever reason, may not necessarily want someone to call them directly on a cell phone or something. They might say instead, you know, they can write us or something. But right. we'll, we'll provide whatever the applicant's preferred means of contact is. Well, and then in my circumstance, I'm sitting here with every surface, every edge of their property line touching my property line. Yet Shopco sat down on the corner, did not respond because they didn't give a flip. And so that could have been an automatic go no matter what any of the rest of us thought. And so with that, that's why here the use on review and variance of Shopco in that example would, you know, not provide any commentary, then they're just not part of it. And what the Planning and Zoning Commission as well as the Council would weigh are the comments that are received from those who do comment. On the zoning changes, that's an excellent example that there are some, you know, properties that are held by large companies who would not respond and if they don't respond, then the applicant a lot of times would never be able to reach that 60% threshold, which is why then the applicant would be able to approach the council and state they've tried, but they just don't get a response. And, and even in that circumstance, that shop co property is big enough that even not talking valuation, it still mm -hmm. has the... Has a percentage. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Other discussion, use on reviews, zoning changes. Oh, you bet. Churches and nonprofits. Please come back to Churches and nonprofits before had no value because of no sales tax. With these proposed changes, it'll be by the size of their lot if they choose to comment. But when you say they're they're not assessed, there is no. Is it that there's no assessed value, or Correct. they're just not taxed on it? Both. They're Both. not even assessed? Zero. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. What are you thinking about starting a church, Bonnie? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> Subset B. Eric, you might as well stay close, though. Okay. Subset B is... Uh, potential changes regarding Title 18 with camping at residential zones. Mr. Ainsley's got another staff report here, and I appreciate the, the PowerPoints. You guys are – we're getting our technology up. We're getting there. Thank you again. Um, this item, again, is something that has been brought up several times about um, how necessarily – or what are the steps that the council would like to uh, proceed with enforcing the residential – uh, camping ordinance. The residential camping ordinance was passed in 2012. Previous to that, the only camping that was authorized in the city of Sturgis is if you were in a uh, camping zone, which at that time there were only two uh, campgrounds that were zoned appropriately in the city. And of course, we all know that uh, during a certain time of year, there tends to be more camps, um, campgrounds than just those two specific campgrounds. So um, at that time, the city passed an ordinance that would state that um, resident or camping could occur outside a camping zone if there were 19 or fewer campers and if they were an owner-occupied property. So if it was a townhouse or a single-family home um, where the owner lived there, then they would be able to have up to 19 campers there. The one exception that would go beyond that is if it was a piece of property that had had camping occur continually every year before the adoption of the ordinance in 2012. So in other words, it was grandfathered in, um, that it was a pre-existing non-conforming use. That's the appropriate, not grandfathered, but um, that's... Synonymous. Yeah. Um, if it was a pre-existing non-conforming use, it would be able to continue. 
um, at that time, the council was very uh, concerned that they did not want to see more properties being purchased by individuals, um, oftentimes who don't live in Sturgis, that would buy a property, tear down the house on it. That way the assessed value was lower and it would just be the assessed value of the land. And then maybe twice a year or so mow the lawn or weeds and then um, allow camping to come in there and uh, collect the money from the rent and use 10% of it to pay taxes and keep the rest of it. They were very worried about that, saying that's not how you have a, a community. A community has to actually have neighborhoods. And so um, in order to protect the investment of those who had already done that, they said a pre-existing non-conforming use could continue, but once it changes, it's over. Um, you can only do that and you can only take advantage in that uh, way of the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally is if it's an owner-occupied house. Um, to put that in perspective, um, whether it's my office or the planning and permitting office, we get calls weekly um, from realtors who are have a client who anticipate buying a lot. And, you know, one day we'll be moving to Sturgis, and that one day usually is always a year down the road. Um, but one day we'll be moving to Sturgis, but they just need to be able to use it for camping right now. And for nine years now, uh, we've been telling them, sorry, you can't do that. And so... Um, with that, there was some question, some realtors would actually begin reading the ordinances and then they would try to uh, piece together an argument that that wasn't the actual intention of the council. And so we wanted to clarify it um, so that it was very clear that the intention of the city is that you can only have camping outside of camping zones if it's an owner-occupied residence or if every single year that has been occurring which there's quite a few properties that there's camping that occurs when it's a really large rally like last year or the 75th, but the years in between, there's not. And so once there's not camping there, it's over. Um, in addition, once it transfers ownership, it's over. So um, by that, you're trying to encourage properties to go back into their originally zoned uses away from campgrounds over time. You're trying to get them to stop being campgrounds and trying to encourage them to again return to most likely residential um, uses or maybe a commercial use. Um, so there's a couple areas of the uh, ordinance that have some changes to um, clarify that. So it's very easy for people to understand that and it hopefully does away with that argument. Um, also, there's a proposal that all of it be removed from the zoning ordinance and instead placed in the health and sanitation um, code. And the reason for that, that models the administrative codes uh, for camping that are found in the state um, administrative rules. Camping is handled um, under health and sanitation, and so knowing that um, that's where some people look in state statute and maybe it makes sense for the city ordinance to kind of follow suit. Um, I think then, Daniel, it's important to mention too, that that's where we get the 19 from anything over 19 campers makes it a state requirement to be a campground. Correct. And that's where that number came from. Sorry. One and second. then, um, which there is at least one, uh, residence in our community that has more than 19 campers that does get, um, I don't know if it's certified or classified or they go through the process to become a state licensed campground. So that does happen even when they're residential properties. Um, also it, it clarifies that the maximum number of days that camping is authorized is just 15 days within a calendar year. Um, so those are the changes that are being proposed here. In addition to that, there's some discussion about whether or not we should set limits um, within uh, different portions of our ordinance, limits on the number of taps that can be installed um, for RV hookups, which uh, right now, if you have a home, our ordinance requires any RV hookup to go directly to the home, but that means that someone can have three or four RV hookups. Perhaps that's something that should be reduced so that you can't have a litany of RV hookups and in, in a house because again that's trying to say that it's more of a business venture and less of a house and when, more of a 
when you say RV hookup, are you talking power, sewer, the whole nine yes, yards? Both yep. of them, yeah. And so that is one um, that was not discussed by the Planning and Zoning Commission, but that was one that was discussed by the staff as something that maybe should be looked at as to say perhaps one or two, you know, could be authorized, but more than that, then it's shying away from the idea of it being a, a residential area and far more of a, a commercial business enterprise. Questions for Daniel from council on these discussions? Bonnie, what did you have? Come on up. Clarification on, on what constitutes a camper. I read the thing again and again, and I couldn't really tell whether a camper was a body count or a camper was a tent count or so what's a camper 19 individuals staying in outside outside facility. the structure okay so it's a body count yeah okay and that's what i've always worked on is is that's what i understood it to be was the body count but then when it started talking about you know that list of what constituted a unit, I wasn't sure. We'll change it to souls. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you, how do you? <laughs> right, that, that, that would create a how big gray area there, body? Daniel. I mean, you know, it could be three, <laughs> one on each foot and <laughs> one within. Um, okay, and then um, it mentioned porta potties, but there was no ratio of what the expectation would be porta potty to body count. Is there? No, and that's another point that was being discussed, whether or not in here we should note when additional sanitation facilities should be brought in, porta pots as well as uh, garbage, because what occurs quite often in a lot of these locations, and it tends to be worse in the places where they're just bare lots um, that tends pop up, is that um, they require a lot of additional garbage dumps, and usually they're being charged the you know thirteen dollars a month or fourteen dollars a month, even though they're producing you know the average Sturgis residence three four months worth of garbage, and so that's truly not fair. So I think those are other items that probably should be brought up: is at what point should a porta pot be required, and also at what point should there be a special sanitation charge um, brought up for their garbage. And I, I can't tell you what that number is right now, but right. I think that's something to be brought up that probably should be done. Well, and, and my decision on doing that always is determined by my projection on who's coming this year. And, uh, I mean, because we don't do just random people coming to town need a place to be. We have the same people year after year. I mean, some of them have been coming for 35 years. And so... Um, and garbage-wise, our dumpster never even overflows. I mean, I, this year we had, like, 15 added, added through the week, and I think we made three bags of garbage on that. So, okay. And then, um, well, that, excuse me, that'll do for now. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, I know. But, so what is... What, what prompts this? I mean, because the fact of the matter is, like, the people that stay with us and stay with a lot of other people as well are people who are not of a nature to want to be in the, the pasture of the huge camping and being around people you don't know and being vulnerable. Um, you know, we guarantee them um, safety and security and, and familiarity. What, what prompts it, though, Bonnie, is the fact that City Hall gets inundated with phone calls about people wanting to buy old dilapidated houses and t turn them into campgrounds right in the middle of 4th Street. And this will bring clarity to that and give City Hall places to go to say, this is the camping ordinance, and no, it doesn't work that way. Well, I appreciate the grandfathering because it some the exist. on us because of people that aren't even of us are trying to misuse the, mm -hmm. the options. 
But that's what prompts it is just some back, some teeth on this is the way, this is what we want. And like Daniel mentioned, it's, it's the fact that we want people to invest into our town and make single family residence or any kind of living structure versus removing them and making them temporary places to stay during the month of August. So that, that, that's what prompts it is to answer those questions clearly before they come in even and, and ensure that our community is growing versus losing structures. Or impact like um, venters across the street from me, Arlo and Nancy. Um, Probably not at all because of the their their owner occupied housing. They own their home. Right, but they're not there all year. But they're there. So it, if you're not a resident of the home the whole whole time, but you are there when someone's camping there then by definition it would be owner occupied. So then you'd be able to have campers or okay. or individuals I'm residing just in to tents. Anticipate whether I'm walking into a sinkhole or not. As far as what the intention is is to change is to make it a lot clearer for the people that have questions and to keep what things are existing the same with the people that have campers at their house and, and people coming to visit. Hey Daniel, isn't the other change too? It's is right now it's fifteen days in a month versus fifteen days in a year, calendar year. Yeah, and that counselor, I'm sorry, I, I don't fully remember the history behind it. It was in twenty twelve, but there was a lot of discussion about how that should be divided. And I I think how it was written was actually quite convoluted. What they were concerned about is that you shouldn't be able in a one month period to have more than 15 days. But yeah, it, it was just written uh, strangely to try it to. It didn't meet the across. intent. Yes. The intent was always 15 a year. Correct. But the yeah. way it was written, it kind of gave you 15 days a month. Correct. Right. And that wasn't the idea. That wasn't so, the intent. Yeah. Understood. Okay. How would this affect, uh, say, a family member or a friend that stayed on your private res residence for like a medical treatment? once a month for four days a month. I mean, obviously they would go over the 15 day limit. Well, at that point, no, that, I, it wouldn't be authorized for someone to camp on a residential area and camp would also mean in an RV, you know, for more than 15 days in a year. Um, with that, that also comes to the practicality of it to say, um, you know, with the discretion of the officers that enforce this, is that something that's going to be enforced? Now, if someone is staying in a camper for, um, you it's know, from Memorial Day to Labor Day, I'm sure that they're going to be, you know, asked to please move the camper to a place that is properly zoned for it. But if a camper shows up for three or four days and then shows up again in another month, no one's keeping count of when campers move in and out. But if a camper is occupied for 90 days, which there are some in town that do that, you know, at that point, that's going to cause questions. And at that point, we will be addressing, you know, the landowner to say, you know, they're, they're overstaying what the intention is for residential camping. They should be at one of the campgrounds, which now I think we have four or five campgrounds in our city limits. So we have several that are open throughout the year. There's spaces available for it. And maybe this question will be mute because I don't know what those quote campgrounds are, the five, but I know of several private owned properties that have multiple four five and six jacks for motor homes with sewer dumps that are used specifically for the rally. So this, as written, um, this would allow those to stay there. They would only be able to be used for 15 days, which, you know, more than likely is going to occur during the rally. One thing that the staff was suggesting, which I think needs to be discussed a little more and thought about is whether we should be allowing, you know, five, five of those. You know, maybe it makes sense to say you can have one or two but should there be a limit to say how many you can have? I, I like the idea adjoined with the residents, but the ones and that, that is I'm, required now, the, 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 the ones I am talking about right now 
<clears throat> are not even in the same neighborhood as the residents. Well, and if that's the case, those would not be permitted now. Unfortunately, we have a lot of those that have been here for 20 or 30 years Long time. that are still there. But but they wouldn't with, be – if sold, Correct. that use is not allowed. And if not used for one year, that nonconforming preexisting use chain has been broken and therefore the city has the right to say – it's, it's going to be hard. To... And what also prompted this was for whatever reason this year, well, I don't think for whatever reason, the rally was bigger this year. So I think there were more people that had campers compared to years past. And we received a lot more comments from residents saying, look, um, maybe there are hookups there, but it's a vacant lot. No one's been there for three years, four years, five years, whatever it is. Now, all of a sudden, there's two campers here, three campers here, four campers here. I live in a residence. I don't live in a campground. They shouldn't be able to do that. And according to the ordinance, they shouldn't be able to. So we do plan on notifying some of these property owners and saying, you don't have a pre-existing non-conforming use. You know, that goes away. But before we do that, we as staff want to make sure that this is still the intention of the council that before we, you know, tell some of these people that, you know, your pre-existing non-conforming use has ceased, you can't do that. And if you do it in the future, you will be fined for it. I want to make sure that this is what the council wants. Do we have a percentage of how, um, how many residents in Sturgis have campers? We, we did a survey, I'm sorry, Councilor, I don't remember what year it was, 2017-ish, okay. something like that. I think and it was the year of the zip line. <laughs> was that the year? <laughs> so it was before then. Um, but, yeah, we did a, a survey, and I think it was 15% of residents had campers and 10% had uh, – they rented out their homes. Although I might have that switched. It might be 15 one and 10 the other, but it was 15 and 10 um, I think it was 10% had campers and 15 rented out their homes, but something like that. Well, I think it's a good idea to always clarify, um, ordinance, but I also think that, you know, for that 15, for those, that 15% of our citizens who have campers, and we know that for some people, this is, um, you know, a form of revenue. Um, I think for me, it's important that we don't put any kind of hindrance or undue burden or, you know, um, any roadblock um, for them to continue to do that. So um, because I think that those residents being allowed to have a, that stream of revenue, you know, and, and getting, um, getting that commerce and business from the rally, it's very, it's important. It's an important aspect that our residents can do that. So I just want to make sure, for me personally, that we are not hindering our citizens um, in, I, in looking at changing these. And I think that's done best with the owner-occupied and the 19 that the state allows gives the greatest chance for our citizens. Yeah, sure. And I, and I think this is a, you know, it's a really good start. And... Um, it's it's a good thing that that we are looking into this. Other discussion on this particular topic of Title 18 and the proposed change to Title 11 on camping, public or council. Come on up, please. Yep. Use the microphone there so they can hear you online too, please. You can have, you know, the 19 campers and all that during rally. But I, I don't remember who it was that brought it up. If you have a family member or somebody uh, not, not at rally that wants to come stay for three weeks or a month, you know, you have to make them leave and can they come back? Or I guess well, I'm a little confused about the two-week Limit. The way it's written, there's a 15, the, the proposed language, there's a 15 day cap on that. So, but as Daniel stated, outside of the rally and outside of 
you know, extent, excessive use from, you know, most of the summer or something, the chances of it being seen and then made an issue is probably rather slim if it's a, if it's a few weeks or just visitors, you know. Um, I don't think that's the intent at all to hinder, like Councillor Zerps was saying that, you know, it's not our intent to hinder the, the residents at all but we do wanna make sure that we respect the neighboring properties, property rights of, hey, I live in a residential property, not the campgrounds. So and that's I, the fine balance. I understand, you know, people wanting to buy the property and clear it off and just use it for camping. I don't know if that's the greatest idea. <clears throat> I'm gonna make two comments there. I see an opportunity for a permit. If, if, if your kids wanna come for a month and stay with grandma in the backyard. There should be some means to offer a use permit. Uh, so that needs to be looked at. And uh, I think we're making some real good progress on all of this. Uh, but we definitely need some, some way to register the people who are the properties that have four, five, and six RV hookups? And do they have to be owner-occupied properties? What I'm, what I'm saying is, I know of several that are not owner-occupied properties. They're, they're solo properties that have been developed on vacant properties just simply for the revenue of multiple campers. And in those particular cases, if they have been under the same ownership and continually operated before 2012, they'd be able to continue. But once they are sold to a new owner um, or they are not used for a year, then that goes away <coughs> and they would not be able to use it. Um, and if they do use it, they would be fined. That's going to be tough to prove, isn't it? I mean, Dave's going to have to go out and take pictures of everybody with a camper hook up during a rally. So he, he, he already does. Back. <laughs> go on up, Dave. No, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go off script. No. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Victoria. I just want a point of clarification so you know from someone who took a lot of the phone calls this year, the majority of the complaints did not come uh, we're not about our city residents. They were about people that came from other communities that purchased a house, did some remodel on it. Next thing you know, they got the house is full of them, their friends, and their campers all around. That was where a majority of our complaints came from or, or were about. So I don't think we're looking, we're not looking to um, limit our residents from allowing that use to generate some income, but we need to look at the people that were buying the properties now that I've got to deal with in the summertime and the wintertime because nobody's there until they show up for the rally. So thank you. You would be surprised at the number of calls that come in on a daily basis of people that are trying to buy any home or even now what is happening are lots. And there's been several of them where people want to buy a lot because there's a lot for sale for 50 or 60,000 and let's buy it. And of course they don't have time to build a house now, but they will next year. They just want to be able to camp on it. And it's, that's something I think the previous councils have wanted to avoid and say, we should have more residents in our residential areas and not necessarily more temporary campers. You know, on the, on the tightness of the language, though, and kind of going back to what Becca was saying, not wanting to have unintended consequences on the residents, and I thought the last speaker kind of brought up a particular issue, and do we write that into the ordinance where you have that kind of flexibility, or what would be the process, which Mike brought up, is a use permit that allow a family, I'm going to have my, you know, your grandkids, your sons are going to be staying in your camper for this month on your property. They're not, they're not exchanging money. It's not like yeah. you're making it revenue, but it's more about a family unit, you know, trying to use their space as best that they possibly can. We definitely could, you know, if the council wants, we can draft language in there to have a permit to go beyond 15 days to that. 
30, 45 days, whatever you want. Just know that as you start doing that, there will be owners of campgrounds who will also say, you know, we provide these services now, you're taken away. So I'm not trying to say that's good or bad, just you know, there's the same thing. I'm having them sitting in my basement, right? I'm taking away from the hotels. Yeah. So, I mean, ultimately, not everybody's going to have all the kind of money where they can just come stay a month and stay in a campground or in a hotel. But you're trying to bring your families together. So, current morality is with a lot of areas that have shared, for example, garbage. And now all of a sudden you've got 15 people in your, your backyard. And sure. You filled up the 300 yard tote and they're upset and they don't want to pay anymore. And my neighbor didn't pay anymore. We don't have a way to well i'm speaking outside the the rally too i'm talking about but again i do think what becker brought up we don't want to have unintended consequences here on tightness of a language that's going to impact people's way of life what they're doing right now and it's not really impacting the city significantly and if you have a permit maybe there's a cost to it a little bit because of the garbage increase whatever that may be if the council is interested we can definitely include in the draft for your first reading you know, a permit that uh, would allow someone more than 15 days in a calendar period, you know, one camper or something like that for 30 days beyond 15? Well, it's, for, for the council, uh, I've, been, I've been watching it for decades. I, I literally have. And what I have a problem with is running that 600-foot power cable <laughs> that's this big around out of the basement window on a 220 hook to a camper that's sitting on the street so that six people can sit there in air conditioning for the entire rally. That's the one that bothers me. And that would be illegal. And in the past, uh, this year, we did address numerous violations, and that happens every year. And just to be honest, we don't immediately ticket people. When we see that, we tell them, look, you got to move. Spot. And if you don't move, you know, you you will be towed, ticketed. Usually what happens with that is they say, well, I paid, you know, Joe right next to it. And then we have to explain, well, you know, Joe doesn't necessarily own the street. Um, so and I wasn't advocating for the street yeah, either. I was talking but, about on your property. Right, right. Yeah. Right. So that That currently is illegal. And whether that's during the rally or if it's July, that's illegal. You You can't camp on the street. The the biggest thing you'll see now that I mention it, you will see it. The semi semi tractors, not with trailer, but they bring the semi tractor and trailer in. They drop the trailer for vending or whatever, and then there's half a dozen people live in the in the camp in the tractor trailer in the tractor on the street. Yep. So I mean, it's it, it, you'll see them. Yep. I think Daniel too included in that draft language for first reading should include an arbitrary number of number of hookups and then council can discuss that further. Sure. Well, and what I'm wondering is what if you were to increase the number of days from 15 to 21, um, something that is not crazy high, but would allow um, if you were to have family members come for a summer vacation or something like that, um, you know, that might be one, one way that you can look, um, at addressing that, that particular situation. I guess for me again, personally, I don't know that I would be supportive of a, of a family having to go get a permit to have, family members have their RV in the driveway or, you know, if it was going to be over 15 days. Um, I think that is just some, again, burdensome <laughs> on people um, because I, I don't know. Again, I just, I don't know that, that I would support that, but perhaps looking at an increase in days from 15 to more than 20. Other discussion. Go ahead, Bonnie. Come on up. What do you have? I don't mean this antagonistically, but I'm, you know, I'm kind of sitting back and looking at the whole thing that's going on. And I have to ask why we are solving a two week problem with a 12 month solution. Is there not a way to address this and um, accomplish 
what we want to, I mean, this is something that's happening during the rally. Yes, there are some, you know, incidents throughout, but we're talking about a 15 day period here that is problematic to us. Why are we talking about a 12 month solution that then becomes burdensome? I mean, to tell me who I can have for company in a house I own seems like a little too much control. And specifically, it doesn't affect me. You know, um, it's not a problem for me, but, but principally, that's a little too much control for the city to have that much say about my company. And I think that's where Becca is kind of going. Um, I mean, yes, I do the rally camper thing. My mom did it for ever before she died. I do it basically, I feel like flowers at the National Cemetery once a year isn't enough. This is what I really do to honor my mom is I keep her campers coming. And, but it just, it's getting kind of not just complicated, but convoluted. So I guess I would encourage a little out of the box thought of that we might be over solving the problem. And that if we have some issues that, that need to be addressed year round, maybe they don't need to be addressed in this same voice and solution. So. We'll continue the discussion. Thanks, Bonnie. Daniel, would you say that your requests have been more this year than years past? Um, Ever since we made camping, <laughs> since 2012. The, uh, there were more requests this year, yes, but it's not, a, it's not unique to this year. You know, maybe it was 10 or 20 percent more, but every year it's always a a request to buy properties and I was just curious how much of it was be, being driven by the actual housing market as well people wanting to sell their houses for a profit they could buy a lot you couldn't buy the materials if that was driving some of the cost this year and it, maybe it's an outlier it could have been but I think that would be on the margin as far as how much of an impact that was okay that has occurred for a decade now any other discussion on this matter Come on up. You've been waiting patiently, Joe. Joe DeJarlis. I uh, hate to throw myself in front of the bus on this deal, but I have to piggyback on what Becca says. As someone that's had a campground or guest in our yard for over 30 years, I think it's hard to not allow people that have bought a home and live here year round, not to have the same advantage of being able to have campers in their yard. And it's no different than I think people that rent their homes out, the holy grail of, you know, people that get to make $10,000 in a week or 5,000 or whatever, that if they buy a home, they get to have people in their house and they do get to rent those houses out, even though they're new buyers. So. I guess I'm trying to defend the people that may be new to the town, like the guy that just bought my house. He's planning on living in that house year round. And we had campers at my house, and now he's not allowed to have campers at his house, unless I'm wrong. Is, no, he wouldn't be able he, he, to. No, so he, he if he owns, if he owns the house right. and he's a new owner, yep. he can have. Correct. Yep. I, I With, without the house, Joe, is where the difficulty comes. Okay. Only the, and I understand yeah, those. Yeah, and yeah. I just wanted to make sure that was not something that was no. – those people aren't allowed to have a, a small campground. And I guess I saw in the, the, the new um, literature that it says units, 19 units, which is confusing instead of 19 people. I think that's on the last page. And I, to, units to me means a tent. Correct. Okay. And the reason for that when this was discussed in 2012 is there's – we would not be going in to see how many people are sleeping in a tent or in an RV, but it's pretty obvious then if there's more than 19 tents or 19 tents and campers that you exceed that number. So if you exceed it, you have to be a state licensed campground. And if you're not, then you're in violation. Yeah, Daniel comes and visits us 
at the rally <laughs> every year and mentions to us that he thinks we have more than 19. Bring his clicker. <laughs> yeah, with his clicker. And so, you know, I, I guess we were definitely, you know, had a, a little larger. And as some of you know, we live on 20 acres. So we have a little bigger opportunity to have just a couple more campers than the normal. And we do rent extra totes for sanitation. And, you know, and I guess if the city can have outhouses to maintain the amount of, you know, sewage that they have, I don't know why these houses can't have it or campgrounds, you know, they should be able to bring them in and bring in a tote. I agree that maybe they should be required to, you know, and I concur with that. Yeah, if if it looks like, you know, there's somebody new or somebody's in town that wants to have it, you should say, well, you know, we think you should get the big tote and we think that you should have, if you don't have, you know, the capacity, you should bring in an outhouse and help with, you know, that. But there's houses that are rented that have way more than 19 people in them. <laughs> and there's just as many loud people that rent houses as there is that are in campgrounds and like Bonnie says, there's a lot of folks that don't want to go out to the chip. The people that stay with us are very appreciative that we offer a place that they can stay in town in a small family backyard. And most of ours are, I think our average age is 60 that stay with us. So they're a bunch of troublemakers. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I guess if there's any questions as far as somebody that's been doing this a long time. And I don't really know that there's a statute in the state that says 19. If you call the state, there is no such number that I know of. So I, that's, a, that's another ambiguous number that I think has been out there. I don't think it's a bad number. I'm just saying I don't think that's the number. And your, your facility, you know, number one is pre-existing and non-conforming, but number two, it's in your development and annexation agreement that you're able to continue, and also number three, it, you're at a state licensed campground, and so none of the provisions in here would affect your business, you know, your operations. I know. I, I'm just helping defend the people that mm -hmm. may be out there that are trying to do this. And we've taken measures now because the guy with the clicker has pressured us. And also the fact that we used to be able to make enough money <laughs> during that week to uh, pay the expenses, and we no longer can. And so now we're having to increase our facility to a few more days during the year so um you you literally had a neighbor or someone in the community no no, 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 I'm, no i'm joking about that <laughs> i, I, I say, did have somebody say we had 400 you don't need people, those neighbors so so oh. anyway if nobody has any questions for me thanks joe thanks joe thanks I, I wouldn't put it past somebody to be looking with a clicker, though. Well, any last discussions on Title 18 and camping? We'll bring that to first reading. What do you have, Bonnie? I just wanted to point out that the Title 18 about, I thought I heard Dan say that by next meeting there'd be a document. There, there's already a document in the packet, and right. so that's already the working draft. There will be changes made to it. What I would anticipate after hearing the council discussion is that 15 days probably becomes 21, which might morph to 25 or something like that. The council will be able to discuss that. There's probably going to be a paragraph in there about a residential camping permit that, you know, over 25, someone could apply for an additional, we'll probably say, 30 days, and the council can discuss that and see if it makes sense and if they want to include it or not. Again, it's up to the council prerogative, but just what I've heard, that seems to make sense. Um, there's probably going to be a requirement that if there's over five units, I would imagine, which a unit would be a tent or a camper, then you'd be required to have a porta potty um, as well as additional garbage services and also a limitation on any time a new um, Oh, camper um, uh, hookup for an RV is done that it's limited it to probably per parcel. So those are things that will probably be changed in this ordinance for the council to consider at their next meeting. And I anticipate that they'll discuss it similar to this and 21 will become 25 or 27. And I don't know, they'll agree to the permit or, or they maybe won't. three and then it would really yeah. pack the rally down. Yeah. <laughs> well, but 
where I'm going is it sounded like you were trying to have something ready for a first reading in two weeks? Yes. Correct. We, yep. we do. Are we locked into that kind of a time frame? So what will happen, those will be the changes to the draft, the draft that's already in there. The council will discuss it, and I'm sure they're going to make revisions compared to what I just said. If they feel comfortable, they'll pass a first reading. If they don't, they'll table it and wait two weeks to discuss it more amongst themselves as well as amongst the community and come up with a, another version. So we're not locked into any of this. It's, it's just, just that's the anticipated, and if they have a lot of discussion, it'll probably be another two weeks beyond that. Well, and it, that's where I'm going, is it seems to me that sometimes we're moving forward on an issue, but we get locked into the Lucy and the candy factory in that once we start talking about it, oh, we've got to have a first reading two weeks, and then we've got to decide in two weeks, and I've never... Well, I shouldn't say never, but I can't think of a time. I can think of some times that we should have started over and given it more time, that we don't spend enough time kneading the bread, that it seems like enough considerations have come up in this discussion that a rewrite is probably going to open some more doors to discussion. And it's always, I'm always frustrated when I feel like the council is moving too fast and not thoroughly exploring the possibilities because there's this sense of two weeks and two weeks and it's done. And some issues are more complicated than that. And I think that we've raised enough issues here tonight considering what's different about the rest of the year as opposed to the rally. I'm still now, after the last thing you said, now I'm confused again about who can continue and who can't because I thought you said when the property changed hands then that... Correct. It, if it's not an owner-occupied residence structure. But if it changes hands in that person. No. So no. It, once a property becomes owner-occupied, they are able to have camping. That's the same no. last year, yep. this year, and next year. So if I sell my house to another individual and they live in it, they're able to have camping there. That's up to them. Okay. But now if I, which I do not, but if I did have a parcel that had 10 RV hookups on it and I was leasing it out to 10 folks from Colorado and they came in, if I turned around and sold it to Faye, Faye would no longer be able to rent it to those same fine people from Colorado. Without a structure and resident occupied. Correct. Okay. So I'm, I'm just getting a little whiplash because I think... <laughs> <laughs> well, I think about, okay, I, I have some special people that come to my home they still every can. other year. If they don't come. As long as it's your home, you live in there. They you can, can do whatever. Every three years, every year, every 10 years. Okay. Yep. You choose. Okay, see, and so that's where it's hard to hear all of this and, and keep it aligned. And so then um, where, I, where I have my campers every year. In, in that house, um, you know, one of those properties is still tied into my mom's estate, and we plan to get that rolled over this year. Does that constitute a change of ownership? Yes. Does that cancel what we're doing? Or? Yes. So. Unless that's where you lived. Then you're off. Well, if it. It's where I lived during the rally because, <laughs> because I can't. Then your other house would not be able to then. See, it's just tricky. It, it, <laughs> I feel like the, yeah. the walnut and the pea. I just, I can't keep track of where the pea is going here with if then, if then, you know. So anyway, I just, I hope that we are willing, I hope the council is willing to take the time it needs to fully process the convolutions of this issue. For sure. Thanks, Bonnie. Moving on to the last discussion item. Noise ordinance in Title 18, nuisance and noise changes. Daniel, I'll turn it back over to you. And I'm sure in this ordinance there's going to be no discussion. No discussion So we'll be done by 825 <laughs> tonight. Um, 
this was an item that was discussed extensively by the council, I believe, in 2019. Um, at that time, um, we held a, a session just like this where we brought up proposed changes, and there were a couple residents that uh, described the need to have some uh, some quiet time, and then there were some property owners that expressed a need to make sure that they were able to um, provide, and usually it was concerts, um, and to make sure that those concerts were viable throughout the year as well as during the rally. And so there was tension amongst how are you able to accomplish that, and there seemed to be an agreement um, from residents that were at that meeting as well as property owners that were at that meeting um, to establishing some quiet times. I do not recall why we never proceeded with a first reading and a second reading after that, but we did not. And so um, this item has kind of been on the council priority for at least two years to try to revisit and get that done. Um, the proposed changes in this title would be that a quiet time uh, would be established where amplified sound is prohibited throughout the year. So throughout the year, that would be Sunday through Thursday from 10 p.m. until 8 a.m. And then Friday and Saturday, it would be from 11 p.m. until 8 in the morning. What's important about that um, is, again, when we kind of go through the, the sales tax, not only has the city established more events over the years, but a lot of the private business owners have as well. And they've established a lot of concerts and paid tens of thousands of dollars or whatever it happens to be to get someone to come in. And that fills up our hotels, it fills up the restaurants, and everyone does well. That makes a difference for the community, for their employees, as well as for uh, the community's tax basis. And so this was trying to make sure that there would be opportunities on Fridays and Saturday nights throughout the year for them to continue to have concerts, but also to make sure that there's an equilibrium so that residents know that there's a point when it'll be a little quieter and they'll be able to go to sleep so that maybe they can go to work the next day or just enjoy a nice, comfortable evening. Um, then the, the trickier question was during the rally, and so during that time it was discussed that there would be during the 10 days of the rally, as well as the three days before the rally, um, every day the quiet period would be from 12.30 in the morning until 8 in the morning. So during that time period, it would be quiet time where there wouldn't be allowed um, amplified uh, sound. With that, that's everything. You have to study it to understand it. So we need a table in the, in the document. There needs to be a table it says quiet time starts at 10, 10 p.m. and goes to 11 a.m. And, and it's and not 11 a.m., but or, okay. You, you know what I'm trying to say. Sure. We, we can reformat that to have that, I, absolutely. Because when you read it, I, you know, I read it several times very diligently because I'm one of the complainers about the noise. Uh, it needs to be very definitive. Well, I'm tempted right now to throw another individual under the bus that's new to the community to say that they were the ones that wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't. Um, I will say that uh, we can definitely have a chart uh, to try to clarify that. But And I think that part of what we've been trying to tackle here already with camping and specifically with camping in this is that the balance between the investment in our community by commercial operations and by our residents along with some kind of balance where somebody can actually go to bed at night even if it is August 5th and get up and go to work in the morning. So that's that that's the balance that's difficult there where we are an event town. We hold the states and one of the nation's largest events, yet we still want to have that balance that comes into effect. So it's tricky, as you know. It's uh I have to make a comment now, just it's a personal comment. But life is a lot better without the without the religious orchestra that was next door in the block next door. I mean they, they, they went they went all when they, rally long for oh sure. Oh my god, that was just absolutely getting to the point of unbearable. So Council comments on proposed 
changes to nuisance and noise. Go ahead, Becca. Um, sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess I'm curious because I'm trying to recall our conversation and discussion from a few years ago, but um, I can't remember if we had discussed the differences between the week weekdays and the weekends. Um, and again, I'm just kind of thinking that, you know, outside of really the summer months in town, there aren't really a lot of outdoor um, events, right? Those really start in May, probably, and end probably by this time of the year. So I guess I'm just curious why why we have the difference in in times between weekdays and weekends. When I looked at my notes, these were the, the numbers that I had from okay. that meeting. Okay. As I recall during the discussion, it was mentioned that from several of the business owners that they don't anticipate, of course, in January the hosting, you know, large events. But with that being said, you know, there is a possibility that a tent could go up or something and they could hold an event maybe in March or April. And so that was the idea of trying to say, let's make sure that there is that opportunity for individuals to capitalize because we are an, an event you know, driven economy and tourism is an important component of our economy. You don't want to limit that. But also you're very true that really it's Memorial Day to Labor Day when 90, 95% of the activities will occur. Um, but that's also why on Friday and Saturday it was an hour later um, because there are occasionally bans that are occurring, you know, Wednesday nights or, I mean, the city does bans on Wednesday nights. Um, other nights of the week during the summer months when you can't just say no amplified sound because there are events that happen, but without a doubt, Friday and Saturdays are usually when the longer events are. So, I mean, with, with that, I guess I'm kind of looking or thinking about um, why couldn't we just make it midnight cut off for every single, every single evening? Um, I know that in some areas I've been that that's been the cutoff for those communities. I know that 10 p.m. is what Deadwood does. Um, but I've been up there for an event when there's been a rain delay. And so, you know, then they violate their own ordinance because the concert, the event goers, you want your money's worth. <laughs> but then, you know, if they're playing until... 11 or after 11 p.m., they're violating the ordinance. So, I mean, again, I know that's a specific example, and I don't want to get into the weeds, but I guess I, in my mind, maybe midnight for, for, every, for every night. Other discussion from council? I somewhat agree with Becca. I mean, I think I would like to see it you know, when it's Friday through Saturday, I'd like to see midnight rather than, than 11. Yeah, I just, you know, the key thing I wrote down when you were talking was the balance, you know, between an event town and a residential town. And so you know, maybe during the weekends, you know, at 12 o'clock is, a, you know, a reasonable time frame to do that. But the rest of the time, though, I think 10 o'clock is okay, you know, particularly when it's work nights, school nights and things like that. I, agree I think with, that I mean that's a good balance there. I'm not sure. I would agree, but I'll consider it at this point. I'm I'm pretty close to downtown, and there are times when, when the atmosphere is correct, the gypsies motorcycle racing is louder than the band. It just depends on the conditions there and that side hill. But as a rule, it hasn't been a problem for quite some time. Uh, I don't think it's a big, I don't think it's a big swing from 1130 to midnight. I'm not sure the extra half an hour would hurt or help anybody. But uh, if there's general consensus, give me a call. Talk to me about it. Uh, I can get my arms around just about anything. So there might need to be uh, 
exception for, say, the 4th of July or something that falls in the middle of the week as well. Mm -hmm. Can you think of any other times that you would anticipate other than the 4th of July? I mean, that's one to bring up, but... You know, back when it, no, it's been a couple of years, but I think it was Iron Horse was doing the Road to Summer Outdoor Series. So that began Memorial Day weekend or Were June. Were those always weekends? I'm trying to remember. I think, yes, I believe. Yeah, they may have been. Okay. Yeah. But there again, with the 11 p.m. cutoff, you know, it'd be a question of, is that a late enough date? for a June event. I think those type of events should be permitted. They need to, there needs to be some means that if they don't comply with a volume control, that they, uh, they have to pay a fine for that. So, because that's what happened. Iron Horse literally cranked it, the, I mean, the amps and the speakers that they have, in case they could bounce, they could probably bounce coffee in Piedmont. Uh, it, it was terrible for those residents down there and, and even for the people up along. If, if it bounces off the side hill, it comes right down to all the residents on, on the bottom, down in, on 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, William Street, uh, there's, uh, you know, they were the, they were a primary culprit that caused all this. Sure. So let's just not give them a free hand to go back on, back to doing what the hell they thought they needed to do. But I think you also need to look at the singling out of a sole business. Of Is that what? fair to say that there's only one business in town that needs to permit events? If they're going all outside the rally, if they're if they're going to do that every weekend all summer, you bet I'm going to have a real problem with every weekend all summer. But then shouldn't that apply to every single business that does an outdoor concert? I, I don't think there's very many people in in the city limits that are going to be putting on a a concert series, a summer concert concert series. That, that kind of falls to the to the one culprit. So, if that's the case, then it needs to be discussed. Well, the city, go ahead, Darren. Go ahead. You know, just go back to your question on what other events may be out there, and you know, I don't know what other events may be out there, but whatever we come up with times and dates, having a mechanism for an exception, you know, be a part of it because you just don't know what's going to happen, what kind of events may happen, or an opportunity, or whatever the case may be. So, yeah, a little flexibility. How about other public input? You guys have been sitting here so patiently. Come on up, Kenny. <laughs> Carter's always patient. My name's Ken McNinney, and I'm representing the Knuckle Saloon. Um, as you all well know, that we put on several events, major events every year, annual bull rides, concerts, you name it, car shows, we do a lot to help promote this town. And and I'm sure we're filling some hotel rooms and, and some restaurants and, and helping the community in, in any way that we possibly can. Um, it it appears that, that there needs to be some clarifications in the way this is written. It's written on number three. Restricts outdoor sound amplifying equipment unless it falls under an enumerated exception. What is the enumerated exception? I, I, I don't yeah. understand what that might mean. So when you're able to do it, so it prohibits it expressly unless it's during one of the authorized times. So it established it prohibits it during the quiet hours essentially okay so your concerts as long as your concerts ended by what's proposed is 11 yeah 11 p.m on friday and saturday which i heard maybe should be 11 or sorry yeah. midnight um then it's fine but if it goes to one in the morning it's not fine right 
Now, now, when we make deals with bands and, and these types of things, sometimes there's contracts involved. And uh, the contracts might stipulate certain hours. Um, it's pretty, pretty strict as far as when they're going to show up, how long the show is going to be, and when it will end. And also, also, you know, there's after concert sound that we provide to hold the crowd so that we can make it profitable for us. Otherwise, we would just wouldn't even do it. So that, that's the other thing that might, this might be too restrictive on is to prevent us to hold a crowd to the later hours to make what we need to make to pay for the band. You're saying, say in the pavilion after midnight, there'd still be amplified sound. We, we, at some we generally point. have a DJ when uh, play and just some dance music afterwards so that we can kind of, uh, you know, the performers, they will sign autographs and, and, and mingle with the, with the crowd just to provide some more entertainment into the evening. When would you usually be done with the DJs? When you have the bands there? One o'clock. And is that usually just on a weekend? Just on weekends, generally. Now, it, it occurs sometimes that we cannot book a band on a weekend uh, because it becomes a, a routing or a pricing issue or, or those types of things. But, yeah, generally one o'clock, and, and then we're all ready to go home by then anyway. It, it comes through the, the, the same set of speakers that the band. Well, no, it doesn't. Be different. Speakers. It can be different. Yes, it can be different. It can be at a lower, lower volume than what the band would definitely be playing at. Well, because of the difficulty with the decibels and mm -hmm. that mess um, that happens is the fact that we've simplified it down to the fact of outside amplified sound sure which i believe does have some overlap on what you're talking about currently um the way it's written okay. so okay that that would be my other point was is that i wouldn't necessarily regard our venue as an outdoor venue i would consider it um, more of an indoor venue than an outdoor venue it's unique in its own nature but um, I don't know that Iron Horse is definitely outside. Um, we are not. What, what about One Night Jacks? The only time they've had a band is during the rally. And the rest of the time they're closed. Is that going to change now? One Night Jacks is usually open in June and closes late August. Um, they're, I, I don't really foresee them adding more bands or anything else. I mean, the they're vast side anyway. Yeah. Well, I heard, uh, I heard it changed hands. Yeah. So we don't know what the future is going to bring there. But, but uh, I think these are the, the issues that you are going to have to weigh. <clears throat> you know, ultimately when you decide that cutoff time, because, you know, when you hear one venue saying that they still want to be able to go until, you know, midnight or one in the morning, you know, on a Friday or Saturday night, that is something that you're going to hear residents say, no, you know, they don't want to hear it that long. Maybe during I can't the rally, imagine that's okay. Iron Horse is going to want to shut down at 1130 or even midnight. What I'm saying is there needs to be some control there. Yeah, so we're asking you to set those parameters. Tell us what that is. I'll tell like you, that. I can't hear Kenny's, you know, unless mm. Turkey forgets to turn the speakers off. Well, that, yeah, that's happened before, but I'm, I'm, I'm mostly a I'm going to be on top of it, okay? I know. That's the only <laughs> time I had I could hear the knuckles. Yeah. Well. Is when there's no other sound in town except them. And, yeah. and I think what you're saying this, that was a long time ago, and we've 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 pulled the reins in on that, so we'll take care of it.
I think I think your neighbor came up and unplugged the speakers. Oh, he probably did. I don't know. But but I think the other question in your particular case with the yeah. knuckle is you know outside amplified sound. Sure. I, I agree. I thought about this at the pavilion there. Yep. Pretty much indoor. I mean, if it's raining and you're dry, it's yep. hard to say it's outdoor. I mean, it's but it is open and there is sound that travels. I mean, yep. it's it's just another gray area that we got to help try to make more clarity in here. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, right, clarify things and see where we go from here. Um, the, the other thing I see here is on number five. I'd like a clarification on the revision eliminates the exception which allows performances presented to the general public on private land, public or private land, excuse me. This exception is generally allowable under the proposed revisions. Uh, that's confusing to me. This ex what, what does this exception mean? Can you hear me? He's looking. Okay. Mr. Miller's looking to. I'm sorry. 18, yeah, number four. Right, Kim? It's actually number five. Five, yeah. Uh, sentence number two. Starts performances on private land. Where you at? Okay, but what does it mean by this exception? What uh, is generally allowable under the proposed re revisions? The, the, the number five is completely confusing to me. I think well, I can answer that. <clears throat> uh, the current ordinance actually has an ex as part of the exceptions. Uh, it has performances, shows. I, in the ordinance, it's marked out because okay. I th think with the current change, because previously I think it completely there was a shall that unless it fell within one of the exceptions, it would, you were unable to have outdoor performances. But with the change in the ordinance, it would, as long as it's within the proposed restricted times or not within the times or ends by 11 or midnight or sure. whatever the time is, then any private performances should be fine as long as it ends within that time frame okay still a little confused but uh, but i mean previous the current ordinance it, it, it has specific uh, what it allows the current ordinance allows if you're going to have a concert or an outdoor show or things like that and it's specific to that in it's in the ordinance the way it's written Basically, with the revisions, the exemptions are allowed as okay. long as it falls within the time frame, and it doesn't have to be specific to the given ordinance outdoor performances okay. list. Here's another one of my concerns. Um, okay, there's us, there's the Iron Horse, and there's, I, I don't know, we could name a few others, but there's maybe less than five. Uh, venues in the city of Sturgis that provides what we provide and has the facilities and the capabilities of doing the events that we do. I think it's 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 uh, a little restrictive to have only five when how many other bars, restaurants, um, campgrounds, and other places that are making a lot of noise uh, besides us that are, you know, it just seems like we're getting pinpointed here a little bit. And I know, and I know that that wasn't, I'm, I'm not trying to be antagonistic in any way. I'm just trying to point things out as well. I, I think the differentiation there is the outside amplified noise is the differentiation, which your point is well taken, but I think that's where that differentiation comes again in your situation and situation down the road at the loud, I mean, there in my mind, there's question: What is considered an outdoor facility? What is what is outdoor? I mean, that that definition I is agree. a little bit gray. And I I think though it is important to note that the reason why these are brought forward is time and again over the past several years, ten years, you know, those five like you said facilities are usually where we get noise complaints. 
especially for um, you know larger neighborhoods. Yes. So, you know, we might get occasionally a noise complaint from one or two neighbors saying that the house next to them has a house party going on that's too loud. But, you know, if you get a lot of noise complaints in an evening, it's going to be from one of those venues. And so this is trying to reach that balance to say we want to encourage events to occur because it makes a difference for everyone, but also make sure that there's able to be quiet enjoyment throughout the community. Uh, Mike had mentioned uh, something that it sounded interesting, but I don't know if it would really work um, as far as uh, like use permit or, you know, if you applied for it, like if you did like uh, on off sale and, and I don't, I'm just trying to make an example that, that maybe it could be handled in that way so that there's a heads up between the council and the venue and then maybe something could be done to let the public know that of course we're gonna we're gonna be we spend a lot of money on advertising on facebook ads on various other means to promote the concerts because it's in the contract we have to do x amount of advertising x amount of this and that in order to perform for that contract. But I'm just trying to say that that it seems that there could be a better way to do it, maybe. The reason I, I kind of mentioned the use permit of some type is simply that then the police department becomes aware of what's going on. Uh, I know for a fact that there's two times that I called the police department myself I, I mean, dispatch or whoever you get a hold of. I don't dial 911, but I've dialed the police dispatch number for other residents who call me as their ward representative. And they tell you the truth. They don't want to hear you. They don't want to listen to you because there's nothing that the police department can do about it. I mean, literally, if we have to put some type of mechanism in place where there's some some form of identifying the issue, uh, I I know if you're up on the on the ridge of North Sturgis, up on top of the Seventh Street and up in those areas, the noise is a hell of a lot louder up there than it is at my house. That's just the nature of it. Uh, how you how you gauge it, I don't know, but uh, it is a problem, and it's bigger than most people think. Now there has I I can't think of anything here in the last year. I, I really can't. Well, how about other public input on add to this? Thanks, Ken. I think uh, more to just thanks, thanks Council. Yes. I yep. appreciate it. Yep. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Um, Mark Brook with uh, Loud American, of course. Um, I guess. Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, things that I wanted to say had been touched on to some degree. I mean, we all agree that we're an event-driven town, and uh, a lot of I mean, the most important thing that we do, whether it's a rally or whether it's something the loud does or the knuckle does or the anybody does, is the, the you know the experience, the customer experience. And you're trying to create an experience to keep people in town because we all know the math: the longer they're in town, the more money they're going to spend. Um, being an event driven town. And I also feel like we do a great job of it. We're lucky. We've got uh, great support from the city with events like Mustang rally, Camaro rally and everything else. One of the challenges has always been um, we host those events that, and especially those in particular are really helpful for a day, but we need other avenues to try to keep those people in town. Um, 
whether it's to stay in town at a hotel or keep them a few more hours in town so that, again, uh, we generate some more revenue. Um, one of those is obviously with through some uh, late night entertainment. I mean, for for a lot of us, late night entertainment anyway. I'm uh, I'm like uh, most of us, I think, in the room. I I don't uh, in my twenties and thirties, um, you know, enjoyed this stuff till two o'clock in the morning. I don't so much at, at this age, but. Again, we're driving, we're trying to do things for the customer. And if we're going to have this customer experience, we need to have these things. So um, one thing I'd like to point out is that, uh, you know, younger folks, they aren't out until after dark. And it almost doesn't matter whether it's Halloween time or whether it's, you know, the 30th of June. And it doesn't even get dark till 930. It's uh, late in the evening before you can even get them out on the town. Um and obviously in the summertime, like I said, we don't even get dark till about 930 at night. And if you're experiencing a, uh, an outdoor show, um, I mean, you can't start the show until you have some people. So um, it gets pretty expensive when they're not there. Well, it does. And that's where it turns into a program, whether it's, you know, uh, the knuckle that has a bull riding, then they have, whether it's a band afterward to try to keep people or a DJ afterwards, uh, the same way we, you know, you have an opening act because for your customer experience, they're not going to be satisfied with paying a ticket price for a, you know, if you get a national act, your, your, a 90 minute show is about what you're going to get. Um, so again, you have to make, create that customer experience. Um, one more thing I'd like to point out on that is, you know, the, we are trying to compete oftentimes and it's hard or hard to compete with the Deadwood and so on because they've got a lot of money up there and they've got a lot of venues up there and they've got gaming uh, they can work from. Um, and that's where uh, a cutoff time that's too early. I mean, we're not the same as Deadwood because up there they, they want the shows to end early so that they'll hit the casinos and, and you know, they've got them in town that way. Here, we don't really have anything once the show's over. So if you end a show at, at 10, you know, it has to be done by 10 o'clock night on a weeknight or 11 o'clock on a weekend, um, you know, you're going to lose, you're going to lose them. They're going to, you know, we don't have, we don't have the other, other experiences for them to go to, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, I certainly think if, I mean, we want to, I feel like, especially, I'll just speak on behalf of the Loud America, we're, we want to be a good business um, and certainly sympathize with the residents um, in, in in our town. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, we've had a street dance years ago that um, we had complaints cleared by the hospital, but it was one of those evenings, as you know, that, you know, sound carried everywhere. And I don't know what we do about those situations as we sit in this bowl, but I do know that... Um, as our town, we're doing a great job in town, I feel like, and a big part of that is um, through these events. So um, I just hope the council is, uh, you know, strongly considering that as we work through this. I think we need some, uh, if we want to keep growing our downtown through some events, I think the community is going to have to be, have to make some sacrifices, like I think was Becca was pointing, or somebody was pointing out, you know, this window of time is in the summertime is really what we're talking about. Um, rally and the time frame during rally. Uh, I have a tough time with that one because we have a hard enough time keeping people in town uh, as is. And obviously we're somewhat competing with uh, our uh, campgrounds out, out in the county. And it's almost, it's one more thing um, you turn them, you turn the music down. It's, it's, it's almost, you, you may as well start throwing up the chairs because it sends the message that it's over and it's time to get out of town. And I can tell you that, uh, those hours, uh, those hours are certainly valuable hours in especially that, uh, that time of year. Um, so if we, if we're, if we're going to restrict our businesses during rally time, to an earlier time frame, I really think we're going to we're going to handicap our in, in town businesses versus our uh, um, out of town. I uh, 
I mean, part of it, as I, as I was thinking about this, was, uh, you know, what has really changed? And, um, you know, we've been doing this for almost 20 years, and street dances, and somebody alluded to a summer concert series. We used to do a summer concert, streets with street dances, and, um, you know, the bands would play till well, usually about quarter to two in the morning. And I'm not, I'm not saying that that's the time frame I'm aiming for. I'm saying that something has changed here. And I feel like we're maybe trying to, trying to fix a problem, a broad problem that is maybe more of a, uh, uh, an issue in a certain part of town. And I think, um, I think some of this has really changed, uh, with a with a, a certain business and, a, and in the way it's set up and and amplification, I think Mike alluded to it. That's that's different than we've experienced before, and and maybe that is uh, can be more of a focus versus um, a broad ordinance that um, really kind of changes how we've been able to run our downtown uh, th through the types of businesses that we operate um, for the past twenty years or so. So. Um, I guess I don't have anything else. If anybody's got any questions for me, or I think you were very kind and polite in that, Mark. I, and I'm not sure it's admirable for this evening. I mean, we have an issue that is amplified by Iron Horse in the community. And it's only going to get worse. What the council will do in the next several months will make that situation worse. And you and the and the full time people are going to pay the price for it. Appreciate your input, Mark. Um, Carter, you got something to add? You would just wake up. I did. <laughs> You know, right or wrong, it's pretty much between uh, the loud and the knuckle and iron horse, you know. Um, we don't really uh, want to get to where we're so limited on what we can do. Um, I think, um, I know we've had some complaints in the past uh, downtown. Um, there's houses right down by the senior center. I know we've had a lot of complaints there. Um, I don't know where that all stands right now, but I think um, your times, and I, that's the reason I wanted to ask Mark too, what, what, what do you think for times? I mean, uh, we got to work together. You know, you know, we're happy to be here. We're, we're all Sturgis people. You know, we've been here all of our lives and we're just trying to pay bills and make a living like anybody else downtown. Um, you know, I think as far as the Thursday deal, you know, and, and, you know, I, I hear it all night long. There's too much government, too much government. And I can see just some of the things that we've talked about tonight. Thursday night, um, you know, we do catch some bands on some routing things. I think, what was that? 10 o'clock. I think that needs to be at least 11 o'clock weekends. Um, we got to be at least midnight, you know, at least midnight rally. Got to change it to one. Um, just we shut her down at one. That's pretty much what we do. We've had a few times we've we've went later than one. But if we all know ahead of time, one o'clock during the rally, it is what it is. That's what that's where we make our money. That's what keeps us open in January when the snow's blowing against the door and and we have no customers. You know, it's it's a uh, it's a it's a tough situation. I know for you guys as well. Um, I think. You're absolutely correct when you in how the sound bounces off the north there. Um, I I I can't remember who it was that uh, got me to go up the street. I don't know three four years ago to see we had a concert going and it was loud. I not saying it wasn't and uh, on how it bounces and it affects different part of the city. Um, I, we don't need to play music till two in the morning. We don't need, cause we gotta be closed anyway. We want out of there. Um, but I think we need to, uh, really look at this and, and, you know, and, and I think Mark as well as I and Ken and, and, um, we're pretty much it that's open year round. I think that's, uh, 
that's part of the music industry in the summertime that's going to have it more than uh, just a rally. But, you know, I think we should have some input on that. And I think uh, just um, keep us in mind. And uh, we're here year-round, and we want to uh, work with you guys. And I don't know what Mark's thinking for times, but uh, a little bit later. 11 o'clock is, yeah, not going to work. You know, um, we got to go later. Mark? Well, it just it, it made me think, you know, um, they alluded to it from the standpoint of the only way we can compete with in a national act type situation is to get something on a route. Um, and, and you got to hear about it and get to them before, a, you know, Deadwood or somebody else has a chance. Um, but, you know, that can oftentimes be a Tuesday. So if we are, are saying we don't want outdoor events Sunday through Thursday, um, I guess we would set that time pretty early. If we're saying that we still want that option for anything we're doing, you know, realistically, it does need to be like a midnight by the time, you know. At, you, how early do you know when you're doing those bookings, if it would be on a Tuesday or a Thursday or something like that? They come around pretty fast sometimes. I mean, sometimes you you literally within two weeks have an opportunity or sometimes less than that. Um, some well, of them are I, dates that just fall through for somebody else or, you know, a different venue. Will you always know at least three weeks in advance or? Not always, no. no. When somebody cancels in another city or in a, in a competing market, then these guys get an opportunity to pick those bands up. I used to do this, too. You get the opportunity to pick those bands up on short notice, usually at a discounted price. So it becomes a lot more profitable for them than booking a normal Saturday night band. But therein lies the issue about having a permit. Mm -hmm. If you want to say that there's a permit that you could go through some sort of process so the public knows and find out if the public's okay with it. It'd be hard to pull off with the council, yeah. How are you going to be able to do that if they have it three weeks before a show and they need to know within two days whether or not they're going to book it? I, I don't know, Daniel. I really don't. The answer on that would just be simply the time as discussed is to give that flexibility in there. Where the, uh i just tell you, I don't think there's too many people in town got an issue with either one of these establishments. I would say that, and no offense with, you know, your guys' establishments or anything else, but I do know when we last talked about this in 2019, it was from events that occurred, not just at Iron Horse, but other establishments in the city. And that's when we started talking about it. I mean, Iron Horse, without a doubt, is large, but there are other events that are held that cause issues as well. I totally agree with Daniel. You know, I know, uh, you know, we've had some bands, you know, every band thinks the louder they are, the greater they are. That's not necessarily the case. <laughs> Correct? And if you're trying to control the sound. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. But, um, and, you know, I know we had some issues back in the day with KNKL, you know, and that sort of thing, mostly during the rally. But, you know, I, I think even, you know, if you're talking to, you know, once in a while we get a we, we get we get a deal on on a and we haven't had for a couple of years, but uh, on a Thursday night deal, you know, they might be heading to Billings on Friday or whatever. You pretty much got to be four, five, six hundred miles uh, if you're going to get a deal like on a Thursday night. Um, but you know, I think even uh, with the amplified sound, as, as far as a live production, you know, I mean, I think even at eleven o'clock you know, on, on a Thursday night would probably work. Um, after that, yeah, we're still going to play some music, but it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, you know, making the decorations vibrate on the walls. You know, we can turn it down, and, and I would think uh, we're all open to that and, and, and so forth. Uh, weekends and the rally, we got to have our time. So um, I think that could be an interesting addition to discuss as far as the text of amplified outside sound if there was the word live added to that it would differentiate it even further versus the recordings DJ. to keep the people in exactly so playing. just to make it as clear as mud as possible here as we move forward but i think there yeah i think there's differentiation allowable there so 
But I think definitely a good discussion on what we're talking about, and I think there's a reality there of it might not be perfect, but there's times that'll work for both the the people operating the venues along with the neighborhoods that are, I mean, per our discussion, that relatively close to what we have. So I think the discussion can continue, and we'll just keep doing these discussions, and first reading will be in the near future, and we'll keep mulling on it. But feel free to call council members. Um, more discussion as we move forward. So other input from the public at this point? Is yep. there anything not touched on? Bonnie, what do you have? I just want to say that, one, the last thing you said about being absolutely clear and differentiating live music is opposed. And I think at some point the the issue of Outside amplification, we're looking at that as it's performed outside, and I'm thinking that's not what we're talking about. It doesn't matter where it's performed. Are you shooting it outside? And I, that's why I talk about kneading the bread, that you've got to work on it enough that you come to those understandings and can be specific without being encumbered and make the thing work. You know, we've got to get out of the box and not get in such a hurry. In answer to the question of, I don't know what's happened, we've been doing this for a long time and all of a sudden we're not tolerating it, I'll tell you what's happened. We're an aging community. We're getting old. And the people who live around downtown are those of us, what, I bought my house in 73. And I'm almost turning 75. I happen to be one that doesn't bother. I can sleep through anything. It's like lullabies to me. I open my bedroom windows. I live as close as Mike does. I live two blocks from One-Eyed Jacks. Yes, I hear a lot of American. I hear One-Eyed Jacks. I hear the knuckle. When I really hear the knuckle is on your bull riding nights. And so, but I'm of a different mindset. And I know that. I know with the rally. I know what time the bars close. It doesn't matter what time they quit playing music. When they close, then I've got another hour of motorcycles with the street clearing, and then I've got another at least half hour to an hour of the bus, which loads a block away from me. You know, it's part of the rally. We can invite people to come here for the good time and then shush them. You know, we've got to deliver what we offered in the invitation. But I, I think we're coming to some clarity on what and when, although there was one on here that I really didn't understand, Dan, um, the one that said, um, 2 a.m. and 10 p.m. I didn't follow what that one was on, on this, um, the noise, noise ordinance in that background in history. But at any rate, I, I think we can go later without being totally offensive, and I think we have to recognize and we have to reward the fact that, from my perspective, these are the guys and the rest of the people in hospitality who have really been doing the hard work and the promotions and the building of the traffic on Main Street. I don't happen to be a customer. I'm not a drinker, you know, it's not what I do. I don't eat out very often. But I can appreciate what they're doing. I mean, when you look at the things that we've done with the Wednesday nights and the, the things that have evolved in the last couple of years, it's these guys who are making it happen. And, and we've got to back them. Not to the total dissatisfaction of the town, but we've got to back them. The thing that needs to happen is more of us need to die, and then those houses will empty, and younger families will move into them, and then the tolerance will be there again. But... You know, COVID tried, but it hasn't <laughs> gotten its way with enough of us, I guess. But I just think we have to keep a clear line of sight and reward the people who are making it happen. I mean, we've all seen churches just totally disintegrate because they weren't recruiting younger families and they just aged out till there wasn't anybody anymore. And that's about what's trying to happen in a town like this. We're a retirement community. But our population has... You know, the, those of us who are old enough to have been in our houses for a long time are right down there by downtown. 
And I remember when, I mean, I was part of the discussion when we were harping on Iron Horse because they had been way, way out of line. And where the discussion stopped was they, you try and turn it around, putting the, shooting the band from a different direction, and then it just kind of got lost in the shuffle. But uh, I just think, I think we're going a good direction. I think we're thinking good thoughts. I think we just have to not be in such a hurry to have the answer if it hasn't come to us yet. Because it's, it's those little revelations, Mark, like what you just said. Um, that will make the difference in the quality of the product you get. And you know, I've always harped on the quality of the ordinances and, and how they're written. So, Eric's got a new office, and he, <laughs> he would love to <laughs> need that bread with you. But he, he, Eric is handling what we do. So, And to be it quite was. frank, we're getting quite a bit of production out of the attorney's office with, with having two, and it, it's council's seen stuff that we talked about a long time ago. Yeah. That is now coming forward, so yeah. it, it definitely needs to be discussed. And yes, it's clean when it comes. For sure. Under the mask, I'm smiling. Good. Because you know, I've I've picked at the verbiage because um, I think that's important. But you're doing good work. Well, we're trying here. I've, I, you know, I've missed some meetings because well, COVID keeps revisiting. But on on top of that. Sometimes I just get really frustrated with the just spinning tires. But you're doing good work. And I'm more enthusiastic than I've been for a while. I really like seeing you do this, but don't take it so fast you don't do it well. Other input on nuisance. Council, have anything else that came to mind? Well, I didn't even hear the football game. Yeah, big time. Just two other matters before the council. Items not on the agenda to be brought up, which means no camping, no noise, <laughs> no use on review. <laughs> Anything from the public on other matters? How about council? I do know we covered everything in the executive session, so next item is a motion to adjourn if somebody's willing. We've got a first by Dave, second. second by Becca. All those in favor, please indicate by stating yes. 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 Opposed to no, we're adjourned. Thanks, you guys. Sticking it out.